Well, hello and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your guest host, John Mark Grodi, and I have this great opportunity to bring to you another story of what God has done in the life of another another Christian brother of ours. Tonight we're joined by a good friend and colleague of mine, actually, Nick De La Torre, who's a revert to Catholicism and a former Unitarian. We'll hear more about that later. But Nick, welcome to the show. John brother. Mark. Good to see you, it's man. A pleasure to be here. Thank yeah. you. It's always an honor to be in your presence. Yeah. Well, likewise. You know, we'll <laughs> maybe we'll get into some of the bits and pieces, the connections of our stories later on. College buddies. Yeah. Our, our families are good friends, and so I was delighted to have this opportunity to uh, guest host this particular interview tonight. So Absolutely. thanks for coming out, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's let's go back right at the beginning. Okay. Uh, where did this all begin? Well, your walk? there was a, a point in time where my parents were looking at each other and they were like, let's, let's, uh, let's make another human. <laughs> and so uh, that's, that, was the, that was the beginning of me. Um, but no, I grew up in a Cuban American household, very loving. Um, we, we were brought up in the Catholic faith, uh, attending Catholic schooling. Um, and, you know, uh, my parents were very religious. They were super into their Catholic faith. They would give lectures uh, in front of audiences about how, you know, I'm going to skip forward very quickly in the story here. Um, they would they, they give lectures on how the word divorce is a four-letter word and how marriage is so, you mm -hmm. know, beautiful and important. And and then uh, the summer after my fourth grade year, they got a divorce. Um, so that was a huge, uh, for me and my siblings, it was a major upheaval and paradigm shift that just Nobody saw it coming. Yeah. Um, they were very private, private about their struggles and stuff, sure. so it was very unexpected. We were going to have moved to South Florida as a family, were it not for the divorce. Uh, because of the divorce, we ended up staying where we were being brought up in Northwest Ohio. And I continued going to Catholic school uh, and essentially being brought up in two different versions of Catholicism, two different uh, ideas of what is good, true, and beautiful. Um, uh, neither one of them was being executed perfectly. Neither one of them uh, I think they were both, they had their, their right elements and their wrong elements in different aspects. Yeah. Um, uh, but ultimately, between that and uh, my Catholic schooling was very interesting. It was a very small, tight-knit class. Uh, we graduated with a total of 12 students um, in eighth grade. And mm -hmm. so very intimate, uh, like almost a sibling relationship with the, my classmates. But through my Catholic schooling, you know, I learned a lot. I was I was formed in a lot of mm -hmm. uh, the knowledge of the faith, the learning about the history, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, but what I didn't really encounter was like the person of Jesus. And I think that part of why that was, was a lack of witness mm. uh, in whether it was the faculty or um, my even my parents. I mean, you know, especially with the divorce, like the custody battles in our family literally didn't end until it was irrelevant anymore because I turned 18. Yeah. Uh, and that was that began the summer after my fourth grade. So wow. that was a long childhood of, of a lot of turmoil between, um, you know, the custody battles, the constant, uh, you know, living out of a duffel bag week to week, uh, switching houses. And, and then, um, so my parents were caught up in a lot of the turmoil of what that would mean. And I can't even imagine to be in their position for that. Um, and, and my siblings and I were caught up in that, living like nomads and then attending Catholic school where like, for me and my, um, my classmates, uh, I'm not going to speak for my siblings or their classmates, but yeah. for me and my classmates, like, you know, we, we saw religion class like another history class. Like it wasn't something that was about our lives. It wasn't something that was about a living, breathing God. And yeah. they may have taught the words that God is alive, but like it, it wasn't communicated in a way that was internalized in, in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. um, and so essentially by the end of eighth grade, like we got confirmed and we were ready to be done with the whole religion thing on gotcha. some level. You know, um, we went to high school. I went to a public high school and that was my first kind of exposure to public schooling. Uh, I found out not everybody's Catholic. That was an interesting uh, revelation. Uh, and, you know, we did have one uh, Jewish student in my class, and he's awesome. His family's awesome. Uh, but I, that was basically the only exposure I had to non-Catholicism sure. uh, growing up. Uh, but, yeah, so we went, to, got to high school, public high school, and I started getting exposed to these new ideas and these new behaviors and these new examples of what it could look like to exist. And, um, you know, I, I started attending whatever church uh, a girl I was chasing at the time was attending, mm -hmm. joining that youth group for a couple of weeks. And <laughs> I was exposed to a lot of different versions of Christianity just by, you know, virtue of or, or lack of virtue of, mm -hmm. you know, my uh, conquests, my pursuits. Yeah. 
um, you know, in retrospect, that has been so beneficial. Yeah. Uh, not recommending it. <laughs> uh, but uh, so by the end of high school, uh, I was ready to kind of make that move mm-hmm. that we were supposed to have made when I was a, a child. Mm-hmm. I, I decided to move to South Florida. Uh, number one, moving away from your family uh, to South Florida makes it a lot easier to make bad choices. So that's a huge incentive. Uh, don't do it. Um, but number two, uh, it was it was something that as a, I just always wanted to live there. Like mm-hmm. it was almost like I understand now. It was mm-hmm. almost uh, there was a, an element of it that like it was almost redemptive because mm-hmm. that was where my family went astray mm-hmm. in my in my childhood eyes, right? And and so by going there it was almost like I was completing a part of of the journey that was supposed to have happened. Yeah. Um, in my time in South Florida. By the time I was there, I had visited all of these different Christian denominations throughout high school. So I was really not like swinging for the Catholic team. Yeah. Like it was not a, a big priority to me. What was your, so your sense of God, your sense of uh, Christ, your sense of the Catholic Church, like where was your, your allegiance and your relationship in any of those? Was there anything there? You were still attending churches from time to time. So what was in yeah. your heart? Um, I think that there were, uh, throughout that time, there was always an under, underlying understanding uh, of there being something there mm-hmm. that my soul wasn't done with, uh, but that intellectually or or just in my uh, social dynamics mattered less yeah. to me. But like something wasn't letting go of that. Um, you know, why would it be that each of the girls I was chasing happened to be Christian or whatever? Mm-hmm. You know. Um, so uh, before I, I skipped one important step here, and that was that. Uh, in my senior year of high school, before I moved to South Florida, I met and started dating uh, the woman who is now my wife. Uh, we met in high school. Uh, we met our junior year, started dating our senior year. She was this wonderful Christian girl, uh, very Protestant, Protestant, like Catholics are going to hell. The Pope is the Antichrist, mm-hmm. all that jazz. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that old chestnut. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so I was this, you know, heathen that mm-hmm. was wearing the Catholic label and that just drove home for her like yeah Catholics are bad Mm -hmm. um and so I kind of brought all of my yuck into Mm -hmm. that relationship um but we just like loved each other very quickly like we there was something there that God was doing Mm -hmm. um so despite that I ended up moving to Florida like I said after high school Mm -hmm. and uh while I was there I was given an opportunity to sing at a, a, a Christian church uh, it was not communicated to me that it was a Unitarian church. Uh, now, had it been communicated to me that it was a Unitarian, yeah. uh, I probably still would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> that probably didn't mean that much it, to you. It wouldn't time. have meant much. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so basically I started going and I started singing in the choir, had a few singing opportunities. Mm. And like, I'm, I'm a musician. Mm. I have been for my whole life, really, uh, and a performer, love being in the spotlight. You know, you take Nick, you pull out all the virtue, if I have any, uh, God, we hope. And then uh, you, t- you pull out the virtue, you pull out like a desire to please God and serve God. You pull out, a, you know, a, a genuine love for others. And you basically just are left with a super selfish and just gross Nick. And that was the Nick that was operating at that time. <laughs> and uh, I jumped at the opportunity to be in the spotlight, you know. Um, and so I spent time at this Unitarian church and um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of really provocative uh ideas. There were many provocative ideas being presented there Mm -hmm. about self-empowerment and, um, you know, so much of it is founded in the New Age movement. So much of it is is founded in like Eastern traditions. And I don't mean in the good like Catholic sense Mm -hmm. or Christian sense. I mean, Eastern like, you know, somewhere between Hindu and just Buddhism and Mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff. Um, You know, I, I was drawn to the idea of the power that they were proposing we could have. Mm -hmm. Because there was something in me that since childhood, I was always just so intrigued by like the idea of superheroes and superhuman power and like the ability to be more, to rise above what we are now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I always wanted to mean more than I did, you know? And I think that some of that could even stem from the custody battle. Some of that could stem from how distracted, even though my parents loved my siblings and I dearly uh, and did the best they could inherently in the challenges of those divorce dynamics, like it's going to be hard to like really give your kids everything that they need from a relational standpoint, unless you're super intentional about that. And my parents did the best they could. Um, But 
regardless, like whatever it was, I always was just drawn to this idea of like ascending in a sense, mm. uh, not in the sense that Jesus ascended, but in the sense of like leveling up, like like becoming more than I was, mattering more than I did. Is the uh, now maybe you might want to just summarize uh, what you know the a sense of what Unitarianism is. I mean, it sounds like it's probably connected to the sense that a lot of modern people have that they. They they're spiritual but not religious. Like they yeah. want they there's they know that there's something transcendent. They mm -hmm. desire that, but there is perhaps for a lot of the same reasons that you had a real suspicion of uh, maybe a traditional dogmatic mm -hmm. uh, institutional. More than church. that, uh, I would say what was basically propagated there was the idea that you not only do we embrace all people from all walks of life with all truths, whatever that means, right. it is encouraged to create your own truth. Hmm. And so that became the horse that broke the straw's back. The straw that broke the horse's, one of those things. I think things. we get the, yeah. the <laughs> metaphor you're going for. So um, <laughs> literally I was uh, being given, uh, I, was, I was in the bookstore of that, of that church um, and literally the invitation there, they have all these books from all these different world religions and the invitation there is make your own truth. Yeah compile the parts of each of these things that you like, whatever makes you feel good, yeah. whatever inspires you. Um, and so that was like the last straw for me. I, I basically went from that to not believing anything. Because mm. to me, I had been exposed to all the Protestant churches. Uh, in the little town that I grew up in, there was like a different Protestant church on every corner. And you know, with when they're both, when all of those churches in the whole town all disagree with each other about what the Bible says, and that's why they all have different names. You know, First United Methodist Church of whatever, and, and what like w when everybody has their own idea of this is what the Bible means. Oh, and by the way, all of us are also drawing inspiration from the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. yet we're all arriving at completely differing conclusions about what we propose are very fundamental differences. Like one church on one corner might say infant baptism is acceptable, but we avoid it because Catholics do it. Another church across the street might say infant baptism is evil never baptize infants, wait till they're adults and fully coherent. Right. They're both drawing on the Bible, both from the Holy Spirit. And then I see this Unitarian church literally taking that to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. They have a Bible sitting on their podium for all of their services and I all of their services and I never once saw it opened for any of their sermons. Mm -hmm. And then the invitation is invent your own truth. Here's a, a whole plethora, a buffet of truth ideas that you could concoct for your own. And uh, I was like, you know what? None of this is true. Our guest tonight is Nick De La Torre, uh, a revert and a former Unitarian, and he's also, I forgot to mention earlier, he's the president of Awaken Catholic. You can find that at awakencatholic.org, and we're going to talk more about that later. Um, it's so interesting, you know, that that, uh, that that approach to spirituality, the sort of buffet, make your own sort of truth, on the one hand, it, it seems like a ready-made philosophy for the modern mind, mm -hmm. you know, where we, these, these days... Uh, uh, we moderns want to have this perfect intellectual freedom and, and, and we have, you know, the information, all the information on the internet, you know, available to us. And yet, like, we, we yearn for authenticity. And so that kind of backfires when the world offers that sometimes to, to, to young people, the, this perfect freedom to make your mm -hmm. own truth. It backfires because we, we know the inauthenticity of that. It can't, it can't yeah. be that. Yeah, and, and the, the, one the one truth that they did consistently teach or yeah. propagate and, and impose on you was the, this uh, teaching on the, this dogma on the law of attraction. <laughs> so there was this uh, book that was released and then also a documentary called The Secret. Uh -huh. And this secret was this law of attraction. And it essentially is, um, it proposes that we are the gods. <laughs> that we are powerful in and of ourselves by our own merit and we can manifest, the universe can manifest at our bidding whatever we want, mm -hmm. whether it's material goods, whether it's opportunities. Um, and this law of attraction where we're attracting these things from the universe uh, by, our, by our own merits, our own power, our own will, mm -hmm. uh, that is incredibly dangerous because that is so contrary to the gospel. And the most nefarious part of all of it is that in the book, in the documentary, they, they propose that you can be a Christian and believe in the law of attraction. Like it is not contrary to the faith. Well, I'm sorry, but like... We, we subjugate ourselves very deliberately, very, very specifically, we subjugate ourselves to, to God's lordship over us. So it is not our will that should be done, it is thy will be done. Uh, and that's the part that's missing from that equation. God does want us to do incredible things, and he wants to do amazing things in the world through us. 
but like ultimately it's part of his plan not our own plans yeah uh and so that that was the one thing that was consistently like that was their gospel that was their good news Interesting. yeah um and what i what i later came to understand is that that is kind of just a new branding for humanism mm -hmm. and humanism is new branding for satanism because when we are worshiping ourselves instead of god satan's happy he doesn't want satan couldn't care if you if you worship him he just doesn't want you to worship god and if you're busy worshiping yourself you're not going to worship god and essentially i go as far as to say that unitarian even though people are well-intentioned and they aren't going out of their way necessarily to worship satan um, there is a sense in which there is uh you know if you look at the lineage of how we arrived at the new age movement and how we arrived at humanism and and unitarianism there's a sense sense in which that is directly serving the the purposes of um the dark one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah well we, we definitely can see that in our, in our culture at large too that you know as you drift more away from from uh from truth as it's always been understood and and pursued and sought you you don't end up replacing that with with freedom of thought. You just mm -hmm. you just fall back in the same old heresies, the same old sins. yeah. So you acted vi you know violently against that, at least intellectually. Where was was uh, Alina still in? Alina Ohio? was still in Ohio. Okay, uh, uh, that is my w now wife's name. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, after that, um, I, when I when I was basically like I'm done with faith, I'm done with religion. Yeah. Um, I ended up kind of just kind of hitting the lowest point of my life sure. uh, in terms of I was just lonely. I was surrounded by extended family, but like where I had put myself spiritually, mm -hmm. um, where, gosh, if God doesn't even matter, like if, if he's not real, and what what do I mean? Like wh what? why does Nick matter at all? Uh, I, was, I was lonely, I was depressed. Um, there were times in my life that I, I wasn't even sure if I would continue to be. Mm -hmm. uh, by my own choice. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I kind of made a, another radical decision. I was like, I, I can't do this alone. Um, and I really miss Alina. Mm -hmm. And I ended up deciding to move back to Ohio. There was always something about her, and I think this was God working in our relationship, that he wanted me to rediscover him through her. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I moved back to Ohio, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I started attending church with her and her parents at a non-denominational church. Mm -hmm. uh, I was only attending to make them happy. I even joined the worship band uh -huh. <laughs> as a non-believer. Yeah. I was a terrible person. Um, you know, what kind of a person leads worship of a God they don't believe in? Uh. Yeah, it's not pretty. <laughs> but God used it. Over, over the course of months that I was attending that church, I, God was softening my heart. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was listening to the sermons. I was a part of the worship. God was softening my heart. And there was a specific pivotal point in time where um, in the sermon, the pastor played this video. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the, the song Everything by Lifehouse. There was yes. a skit to it. Mm -hmm. The original skit for that... Uh, if you look it up on YouTube, it's got millions and gajillions of views. Um, but the, the pastor played this video, and it starts off with God creating this girl. And um, she's happy, she's blissful, they're in this beautiful dance together. Mm. And then as the video goes on, uh, the devil is introduced and starts kind of uh, enticing her with different forms of sin. Um, even even some of which is as subtle as like a poor self image, mm -hmm. like look at this girl and you don't look like her, right? You know, uh, and they they orchestrate all of this beautifully in the choreography. Mm -hmm. uh, but as she gets pulled further and further from the Lord in this beautiful dance they were doing, uh, because of these sins and these distractions from the devil, um, she just begins to be more and more overwhelmed, and ends up like surrounded by them, and they are completely overwhelming her and it's it's a very uh almost chaotic moment that they create in this choreography and the lord is just trying so hard to get to her and and she can't reach him and she's just in this dark place and then eventually uh the devil hands her a gun and she trembling starts to hold it up to her head and i was like losing it. It was I'm, too real. I was watching this and I was like, 
um, um, like this is this is what my journey has been. Right. Um, with different forms of addictions and battling different forms of sin throughout my life, mm -hmm. and then the, the darkest places that I found myself, like this is my story, and I saw her throw the gun away mm -hmm. at the last second before she pulled the trigger. And she just bolts towards the Lord. Mm -hmm. And all of these demons are boxing her out like so that she can't get to him. Mm -hmm. And they're holding her back. They're grabbing her. And this is also part of the story. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and and then eventually Jesus Chuck Norris's these demons <laughs> and embraces her again. And they re-enter this beautiful dance. And I just I I was crying like a little girl mm -hmm. sitting there. And it was in this moment that I was like, I need saving. Hmm. And I don't know what that looks like um, because I stepped away from faith when I saw the inconsistencies and I saw how like there was no comprehensive agreement about what the Bible meant and how to interpret it. So I didn't understand the idea of where there might be authority in teaching. And that was a major problem for me. Mm -hmm. If God is real and he's outside of time, why are his opinions always changing about things? Yeah. Um, I didn't understand what it looked like, but I knew I needed saving because I was in a bad way. Right. So mm -hmm. that, um, you know, so I kind of went from being Catholic to being Protestant throughout high school, to being a Unitarian, to being an atheist, to yeah. being a Protestant again. But I knew that there was something more to, that I had to figure out because I couldn't just go all in on this without yeah. some of those intellectual issues navigated. Sure. Now, I know we're going to talk more about this uh, a little bit here, but b before the break, I, I've been wanting to ask you, you know, music is a, is a, is a theme throughout your story. When did, where did that come in in your life? Because that was obviously a big, a big important thing for you, and it's something that kept, uh, in, in a weird way, leading you back to have these encounters with the church. When did, when did that come in? And tell us a little bit about that. Gosh, yeah. I mean, I grew up performing on stage, like for the talent shows every year and stuff, but it was always like lip syncing. Like I knew I was a performer. I was actually acting on stage before I knew I could do music. Hmm. Uh, I always liked to pretend to like DJ and stuff growing up, but um, really it was in, I want to say early high school, like maybe even my freshman year that I got a guitar, like an electric guitar and yeah. I started playing stuff and just kind of out of nowhere very quickly, like I joined the choir and it just started to escalate very quickly. And so uh, basically by the end of high school, like I was sold out for music. Like I love music. I love performing. I loved singing. I love composing. Um, a friend of mine passed away in high school and I composed a requiem for him that was performed on his anniversary. Wow. Um, and I just like everything, my life became about music. Yeah. Uh, in college I studied vocal performance, so mm -hmm. like opera. That's yeah. what I studied at, at BGSU. And, um, yeah, so like I throughout high school, I I, I total, hadn't totally like eliminated the Catholic label. I occasionally would like play for liturgies in the folk band at mass, sure. uh, and um, got some exposure to that you know liturgical music that way. Mm -hmm. And then I started playing for worship when I was attending this non denominational church. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I was also in the choir at the Unitarian Church, but I like to not talk about that. So yeah, yeah. So certainly that vocation, that that skill was something intentional with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously that. Well, and I think that the most profound way that it was a part of my journey back to faith mm -hmm. is the fact that music was always such a part of my relationship with Alina. Yeah. We met at a school talent show uh, our junior year of high school, and then mm -hmm. we started dating our senior year, and music was always, uh, like, we were always songwriting together. We were always performing together. We would play on the sidewalks together uh, downtown, you know, like, we, we just loved making music together, and um, the best music that either of us has made is when we're collaborating and mm -hmm. So yeah, so so God made that such a prominent part of us that was always such a connection point and still is to this day. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll come back and hear how that continued. You know, you're you're back in Ohio and you're back with Alina and you're mm -hmm. attending this church. You have this great experience. We'll see where that goes next. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back to hear the rest of Nick Delatore's story. Well, welcome back to The Journey Home. Uh, we're joined tonight by Nick Della Torre, a revert and former Unitarian and the president of Awaken Catholic, awakencatholic.org. 
And we've just heard the first part of your story, Nick, you know, how uh, you grew up Catholic, but, you know, for, for lots of reasons, uh, ended up sort of rejecting the faith. Um, but you're being led back through your music, through your relationship with with your future wife, mm -hmm. uh, through your experiences at the, was it a non-denominational church? Yeah, non-denominational. Okay. Yeah. So what happens next? What happens next? Well, so, you know, I, I realize I need saving. I realize that I need a relationship with Jesus Christ. No idea what it looks like where it also reconciles my concerns intellectually. Um, I know, I, I had a sense inherently that if faith was, was going to be a real thing for me, like there was a sense in which it could not contradict reason. Uh, and I saw a lack of reason in the inconsistencies across the board when you look at all the different denominations, again, that they're all coming from the Bible, that they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. None of that works uh, in my mind. Uh, I had never really considered the Catholic option at this point. Mm. Uh, that was kind of just my childhood thing. I was over it. Right. Uh, it was this, you know, old guys in Rome kind of situation. Um, so anyways, uh, fast forward a couple of months. I'm, you know, I've, now I'm starting to actually worship when I'm going to this non-denominational church. I'm starting to really listen to these sermons and I'm, and I'm active in like the young adult group on some level. Uh, so I'm studying at Bowling Green State University. I'm a vocal performance major. And I, I'm also attending a geology class because, mm -hmm. you know, science. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so the instructor lets us know at the beginning of one of these classes that we're going to get partnered up uh, to work on whatever project. Okay. And, you know, typical college young guy scanning the room like, oh, what pretty girls might I get partnered up with? This is exciting. <laughs> um, and lo and behold, I got partnered up with uh, not a girl, uh, but just the stubby kid that was next to me. And I was like, oh, this is great. Thanks. Greater power in the universe. Um, and gosh, God was there. His hand was there. Um, I'm working on this project with this with this awesome guy that now we're, we're, we're friends and I'll forever be grateful for, mm -hmm. to him for a conversation that would happen now. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you uh, have any particular care for writing utensils, John Mark, but I don't. Uh, I don't really care about writing utensils. But for some reason, in that moment, the Holy Spirit inclined <laughs> my vision to the man's pen. Uh -huh. And I see the pen, and it says, Creed on campus. Uh -huh. And I'm like, hey, what's that pen about? And he's like, oh, this is the Catholic group on campus. You should totally come to one of our events. And I was like, huh, no, good. Uh, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's like, no, seriously, we're going to be talking about sex. And I was like, oh, what time does it start? <laughs> um, and so literally the next night was uh, the, the first time that Christopher West himself was brought on campus and gave this huge per, uh, performance, uh, gave this huge uh, presentation uh, at the University Student Union mm -hmm. um, a ballroom. And I attended that all because of that pen. Stupid pen. If you're anyone out there working for nonprofits, if you're thinking about budgeting money for pens, get the pen. Uh, it could Don't save somebody. It. The pen is mightier. Yeah, the yeah. pen. Seriously. Um, so I'm, I'm attending this presentation, and I brought Alina with me. Again, she was brought up a Protestant Protestant, so you know that wasn't something she was interested in. But she went with me. She was my girlfriend, and uh, we're we're sitting there, and I'm hearing this guy talk about the human person and relationships and our dignity and our destiny and I'm, I'm hearing words that nobody in my life has ever said before um and these messages and i was just like this is catholic like since when does a christian anyone speaks with with such authority on the topic of human sexuality and and marriage and like i just my heart was like kind of opening up to to something in in such a radical way just from how beautiful the, the messages of the theology of the body are yeah but that wasn't even the thing that like changed the game for me that that was like a, you know contributing elements mm -hmm. right but in part of the presentation he christopher west said uh that artificial contraception has always been considered intrinsically evil by all Christian denominations, the use of artificial contraception, mm -hmm. until around a century ago, when most Protestant denominations veered away from that teaching mm -hmm. and started teaching otherwise. And which, by the way, for me is like, so God changed his mind? Like, what is, what is, that, what is the implication of that? Mm -hmm. um, but that the only church that still teaches that the use of artificial contraception is evil is the Catholic Church 
and that the reason is the magisterium. The reason is that the church's teachings can never change and never have in 2,000 years. And, and the reason is that when something is true, it doesn't change. And he talked about apostolic succession and the preservation of truth over the centuries, the millennia. He talked about the papacy. And this is a theology of the body presentation. Right. He's packing a lot in He's there. He's packing a lot in it, it, yeah. but, but what shook me is I didn't know that less than, you know, around 500 years ago, for all of Christian history up to that point, other than like some schismatic heretics or whatever, that like we were a family of the body of Christ. We were a family of Christians. We had a teaching authority. We all believed the same stuff. And that there was this unanimous understanding of what truth was. Something that today cannot be seen unless you're looking at the historical context and you see it in the Catholic Church. And that was the game changer. If there is a God that is outside of time and he is real, then his, then the truth about him and any truth that he wants us to know can be unchanging. It has to be unchanging. I hadn't seen it until this very moment. I wasn't particularly interested in the teaching on artificial contraception itself <laughs> at this stage of my life. Sure. But it was the foundation of like, why? That shook me. Right. You know, I think he might have even mentioned congregationalism where you have these denominations that are like voting on what to believe. Yeah. Let's take a vote. What does God want us to believe now? Like, that's not truth. That's not even close to truth. And I had found the pearl of great prize. Like, I was like, th this is literally the answer to what my, my soul is aching for is, is something I can, I can rest on, a solid foundation that I, that I can build my house of faith, my, my house, my whole life on, future marriage, like this is the answer mm -hmm. to everything that I needed, both because of what I needed to understand about truth and what I needed to find about truth, but then also, goodness gracious, the healing that I discovered in theology of the body and then, and then subsequently in the sacraments, like let me tell you something, my first sacrament of reconciliation following that Priest survived, <laughs> thanks be to God, by the grace of God. But man, the power that I experienced, uh, the healing, um, it's like nothing else. Yeah. You know, you know the, our Lord, uh, the gospel uh, that we receive about our Lord Jesus Christ is so connected to the miracle that is the church. You know, that if we look at the historical miracle that is this church that has persisted and the teachings that have um, that have developed, but but not changed. There's not been a discontinuity like mm -hmm. that. Um, those go together because yeah. again, if if our Lord is who we believe He is, who He said He was, mm -hmm. then He doesn't change. Mm -hmm. You know, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so His church, His body, you know, uh, uh, reflects that. And so yeah, to, to find that, to even to find that claim, I think is again an interesting thing that the church is claiming this for herself. You may not believe that off the bat, mm -hmm. but this is what the church is claiming, that Christ established this kind of a church. He had this, th this vision, this, this, uh, this body uh, that we can connect ourselves to. You know? Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and looking at the context of, if you're really looking at Scripture objectively without any previous bias, like, you see the Catholic Church in it. You know, like, Jesus didn't leave... If, if, you know, th this whole notion about the Bible and personal interpretation that was that I was struggling with, uh, struggling with seeing the validity of, um, like everyone's got to have their own Bible. Everyone's got to memorize that Bible. And if you really love Jesus, you'll learn Greek and you'll translate your own version of the Bible because the, all the translations that have been done in all these centuries, those aren't good enough. You got you to right. translate it yourself to really love Jesus. Yeah. Listen, if Jesus, if the, if the principal concern of Jesus was that everybody memorize scripture and that everybody like n like know the Bible inside and out and that, that you have your personal Bible with your name on it and whatever. He would have left us a divine printing press. <laughs> we invented the printing press in the 11th century. Jesus was concerned for us to know the gospel, mm -hmm. which is not a written page. The gospel is the good news. Mm -hmm. Jesus, was con Jesus left us the church, mm -hmm. right? St. Paul says that the church is the pillar and the bulwark of truth. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as you start to have this like paradigm shift where you like swap lenses out like the optometrist and all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, the Catholic church is written all over these pages of the Bible. Yeah. Um, 
it, that was another major thing for me in, in kind of just going berserk about mm -hmm. Catholic. I mean, I was sold out. I was like, the Catholic Church is the answer to my life. It's the answer to every life. And I want every life, I want every person I know to find out about this answer to their lives. Yeah. Um, I was so on fire, like literally uh, in, in this major wave of like coming back into the church. Mm -hmm. um, this is only possible by the Holy Spirit and then all of the formation I had waiting for me from my childhood. Right. Within three months of that night, I think roughly, uh, that I seen Christopher West, I was already teaching confirmation classes. Hmm. Like I was just, nothing else mattered. Um, and I think that's what Jesus wants from us on some level. <laughs> to turn around and go share it. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that process. How did you go from, from that night? Uh, well, I mean, I always had some, uh, because of my Catholic upbringing and Catholic school and stuff, like I, I learned the things I was supposed to learn. Sure. I just didn't understand yet why it mattered. And then in this yeah. moment, like that connection point happened. The circuit yeah. was, was, yeah. you know, closed or opened? Closed. 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 That one. There we go. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And so aside from that, uh, gosh, I just went crazy reading books and, and mm -hmm. honestly consuming content from EWTN, mm -hmm. um, this show, I watched The Journey Home so much at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I just was like, I could not be satiated. I was just reading and watching and learning all day, every day. It's like all that mattered to me. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I went from teaching a confirmation class to uh, I literally uh, dropped out of the program I had been spending years working towards for opera singing. Mm -hmm. Why did I want to be an opera singer? So why, did, why, why did you want to be an opera singer, Nick? Thanks for asking, John Mark. Yeah, no you know all the right questions. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be a famous opera singer. I wanted my, my name, you know, sense. at the Met in New York. Like, mm -hmm. that, was, that was my life's goal mm -hmm. at that point. And, you know, that was all for me. That was all for the glory of Nick. And I had to slam the brakes on it. Mm. Um, and I just, I, I sold out for God, you know. So I, I became a full-time youth minister very soon after. And uh, from from my work, I think I spent like uh, maybe around three years as a full time youth minister, and then I ended up getting a job at the parish we met at um, as the music director, uh, and I was there for about three years, and then I became a pastoral associate. So I was like the pastor's right hand man for another three years at St. Joan of Arc Parish in Toledo, mm -hmm. and then from there I ended up running the office of marriage and family life for the diocese of Toledo mm -hmm. for another three years, roughly. Mm -hmm. Uh, these jobs keep happening in threes. <laughs> Sets of three. Huh? I'm almost three years into Awakened Catholic. What's going to happen? Mm. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, what ended up happening over the course of probably the, uh, well, a lot of that time that I was working at parishes and um, uh, as time went on, I was starting to be asked to speak at different events, conferences around the country, uh, either speaking or leading worship or performing. I was doing one of those three things. Uh, around the country, and it was starting to get to a point where juggling both of those kind of responsibilities yeah. that God had put before my family and I, my wife and I, mm -hmm. um, juggling all of that was becoming very taxing on my family, which is no bueno mm -hmm. when you run the office of marriage and family life. <laughs> uh, no, it's no bueno no matter who you are. Your yeah. family comes first. And uh, we began a discernment period with my uh, superior at the time at the diocese. It was an open conversation like, hey, you know, God keeps asking me to go to this conference or that conference and speak or do this thing or that thing. And like, we need to figure out how this is going to play out. Do we just not do the other stuff, just do the diocesan work? Or do we just do the other stuff and not the diocesan work? And after several months, uh, there came an evening where Alina approached me because I was working at home in the evening after having worked nine to five at the diocese. Yeah. She says, uh, it's time, Nick, we're done with this. Huh. And the next morning I walked into my boss's office and I said, it's time. And he knew exactly what I meant. He said, all right, do you want to announce it at the staff meeting? I said, yeah. And, uh, so that's how that played out. <laughs> and then, you know, at this point, I, I think we, you know, so we, we missed it earlier. Uh, your wife at some point in this process, Oh, became Catholic as well. Sorry. Let's double back and check on that. Double back. Yeah. Uh, so we, when I went crazy for Catholicism, I was yeah. just all in. Uh, very shortly after that Christopher West event, 
my wife broke up with me mm -hmm. or my, my at that time girlfriend <laughs> broke up with me because right. she was like I I thought we were gonna have a nice Protestant family yeah. this is not what I signed up for yeah. so I you know I actively discerned priesthood during that time like I was you know I did some retreats at St. Meinrid mm -hmm. uh, for discernment um, and during that time she thought we were done mm -hmm. and I actually ended up starting to see someone else at the time which was you know Alina's the one yeah. Yeah. Alina's the one and um so but in that time she as far as she was concerned as far as i was concerned that book was closed we were done um because i thought she would never consider catholicism she thought i would never not be catholic mm -hmm. so and she saw that i was starting to date someone else so she uh secretly started investigating catholicism mm -hmm. not because she wanted to win me back or anything like that she was haunted mm -hmm. by the things that i learned that i shared with her mm -hmm. She was never going to be able to be to, to be a Protestant again for the rest of her life without these ideas haunting her of authority, of of you know sola scriptura not actually being a thing that should be. Well, and I'm sure seeing it, at least to some degree too in your own life that you didn't yeah. return to your Catholic faith and abandon Christ. Yes, that that those two came together, and that was that's such a great point. Absolutely, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but in that that in investigation that she was doing, mm -hmm. uh, she became open to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we ended up reconnecting, not because of that, mm -hmm. uh, but because as far as I knew, she was not open yet, right? But we yeah. just couldn't resist each other. We just we were made for each other, John Mark. <laughs> I don't know how else to tell you. Um, and but yeah, so she ended up becoming Catholic uh, like a year before we got married, um, and yeah, yeah, that's how that happened. <laughs> you know, I wanted to, I wanted to go back. You know, so that that talk that you heard that was such a, a, a game changer. You noted that it wasn't necessarily at the time the theology of the body and, and contraception stuff that was the that was the thing, but it is so interesting that that was a pivotal thing because the theology of the body, you know, for those who aren't familiar, it's this great body of teaching uh, by Saint Pope John Paul II on human sexuality and God's plan for the family, uh, and there's much to be said of it. I mean, it's a beautiful it's, it's a beautiful body of of uh, presentation of mm -hmm. of the uh, Christian understanding of of all that. But one of the things that makes it, I think, so powerful, because I was uh, there around that time, and you know, we heard some of the same talks, and a lot of people were really touched through the theology of the body, was because it really takes something that we're all familiar with, you know, our human sexuality, some, like a, a reality that's very close to all of us, mm -hmm. and it, it points out this design that's just beneath the surface, mm -hmm. this theology, this study of God, this image of God that we see in our in yes. our in our bodies. And it's interesting in your story too, because again, like. So Unitarianism, you know, some of those things that you that you dabbled in, you know, outside of the Catholic faith, there are these little bits and pieces, and there are people who are grasping at these threads. Um, but the, the whole picture, and that's this, that's what we've experienced, is the whole picture is is in Christ's uh, church. You know? Yeah. Well, and and like you said, it it has to do with some of the most intimate stuff in right. our lives. I would also say it has to do with one of the. Uh, the most profound sources of wounds or areas mm. of wounds in sure. most of our lives, um, male or female. Yeah. There are wounds that you have probably experienced that maybe you don't think about day to day, but that are somehow subconsciously affecting you. And that can take a kajillion different forms. Mm -hmm. um, but it really taps into like healing opportunity mm -hmm. for everybody one, one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, so again, we met around that time yeah. there at Bowling Green State University, and uh, yeah, we came into the church, and we've known you since then, a lot of good work in the diocese. Tell us what you're doing now. We, we left off there. You, yeah. you left your work at the diocese. Yeah, so we started um, we started uh, going all in on just being full-time evangelists, speaking, doing music, leading worship, and uh, we held this fundraising event one night uh, at someone's house, uh, and at the end of the night, we're we collected the donor cards, and this one person wrote on one of the donor cards, "Why not NFP?" And you know, if you're Nick at the time, you just quit your job as the marriage and family life guy for the diocese. Your first thought is, he's asking you, "Why are you and your wife not using natural family planning?" <laughs> and I was like, "This is incredibly invasive." Number one, number two, why are you assuming we're not using it? Um, anyways, so turns out what he meant is, "Why not a not for profit?" Ah. And uh, that just sent us down this incredible rabbit hole where the Lord revealed uh, in this incredible snowfall, snowballing effect that he was calling us to something 
to do something so much bigger than just Nick and Alina Della Torre evangelists. Mm. It wasn't about Nick and Alina Della Torre. Um, it was. It kind of got back to the original struggle I had with why I quit opera school. Huh. Or this this is not supposed to be about Nick Della Torre. Mm. This is supposed to be about glorifying God and bringing souls to Him. And in the process of developing the not for the nonprofit. Um, it was just revealed day by day how that was going to manifest. And Awakened Catholic is what that is manifested as. It's, it's an opportunity for us to reach people that are on the fringes, people that have either fallen away from the faith or have never been exposed to Catholicism, never been given a reason to consider Catholicism. Um, and a lot of times, like we have, we have so much good stuff happening in our church, so many different types of people being served. But I just know that there are some people that don't know that they have a place in our church, but that would love a place in our church if we offered them one. Mm. Um, I did a, the last parish mission I did before COVID hit uh, last year. Um, it was this huge tri parish mission. Uh, I spoke there for two nights, and this woman came up to us, this young woman, uh, crying, who shared that she was almost voluntarily going to enter human trafficking to make it easier to receive opioids and I'm getting emotional just now even remembering it but like that is who we're doing this for is people that are receive, are experiencing something transformational because they hear the gospel presented in a way that no one else has presented it before I'm up there on the stage doing this parish mission with my tattoo exposed and I'm being very honest about like where I've been in my life the pain that I've experienced the darkness that I've been in and how much power I have experienced from God the transformative healing power and the work he's done to redeem my heart mm. and mind. And like there, there's honesty that we need to be conveying that we're, we're you know, somewhat over focused on like this political correctness or prim and properness that we're, we're not being maybe sometimes as honest as we could be to open the door for that woman to encounter Jesus in that parish mission. Mm. I don't even know how she got there, right. but she encountered Jesus there. We had adoration. She was weeping. She didn't want to leave. Um, and so that's that's kind of the mission. That's that's at sure. the heart of what we're doing. If there's anything we're doing differently, it's that we're trying to not we're, we're targeting people that aren't drinking the Kool Aid already. We're targeting people that maybe have a disdain for the smell of the Kool Aid, so to speak. You know, um, and and hoping to uh, heighten their their awareness and maybe re-expose them or expose them for the first time to the beauty and the power and the amazing thing it is to be Catholic. Sure. And to be in relationship with the Lord. So if they go to awakencatholic.org, they'll find. Gosh, uh, Awaken Catholic. So we are we produce a lot of different shows. Um, uh, you and your wife do a beautiful job on yours, Elevate Ordinary, uh, and I host a show there. We have a, we have uh, I think eight different shows actively being produced, and we release epi new episodes every week. And um, we also have a, a social media alternative that is also a great hub for the content that we're creating in the form of an app. Uh, so search for Awaken Catholic. Search for Awaken Catholic on your app store of choice, or you can just visit theawakenapp.io. Uh, we're also doing pilgrimages. Um, we're going to the Holy Land this year, as well as we have a women's pilgrimage to Paris uh, and Lourdes. So if you're interested in that, check that out. Cool. Um, there's a lot going on. We're hoping now with COVID lightening up on some level, people getting the vaccines, feeling better about things, we're hoping to get back into parish missions. the parish missions and stuff, because I, I just, I want to walk with people. I want to share my story and, and, and share the good news yeah. with people. Well, very good. We've got about uh, seven minutes left. And so a couple things I want to ask you before we, we head out. You know, number one, looking back from your, your Catholic roots, you know, and all the different things that led you first away from the faith and back into it. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how that, <laughs> the there and back again story has brought you in terms of your own prayer life. And, mm. you know, you described yourself earlier, maybe that the Unitarian maybe wasn't the, the best former label. Maybe you're just, you know, former you know, uh, heathen or whatever. Yeah, in terms we of were your joking before the show that the correct title for me would be former terrible person. <laughs> yeah, well, so but you're back now. Talk about a little about your your vocation as a husband and father and your relationship with the with the Lord now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I uh, my my first mission. Uh, you know, maybe after after the mission to like make sure I am in good standing with God uh, myself. Uh, my first mission is my wife. Mm. I love my wife. Uh, I, I I want to do everything in my power to help her experience heaven here now and get to heaven in eternity. Um, and uh, so, you know, being vigilant, I, I kind of liken my, my ministry to my wife as that of, uh, you know, the one that Adam screwed up in the garden. 
you know, like, hey, he was given dominion over all the animals. All he had to do was rebuke that serpent and not let it do what it wanted to do in the garden. And and to me, uh, as men, we have a similar role in, in our families, in our households of evil has no place here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so I see my role with, with Alina and with my kids as, as protector, um, as, as a prayer warrior for them. And I, I love praying over them if any of them are struggling with anything. Um, and I would encourage anyone watching, like, get in the habit of, of praying over your your family and i don't just mean praying for them privately but like literally put your hands on your wife's head and pray over her okay. now you don't just have to do that if you're a husband like that's something anyone can do but well, you know it's, it's again it gets back to the, this theology of the body we were touching yeah. on earlier that uh this is part of what it means to be a catholic this is part of what we've discovered in in this this whole big picture of what it means to be a, a christian and understood as uh, as we do as catholics that the body matters. Yeah. You know, the body communicates. The body communicates visibly mm-hmm. what is invisible, you know, the reality of the human person. Well, we communicate those things through touch, through through word. That's why, you know, our Lord in His, in His wonderful mercy gives us the sacraments of the church. Amen. He comes to us through the visible things that do invisible things. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he imparts the invisible grace. He changes our life in invisible ways through these visible words and signs and water and yeah. oil and those things. Amen. So, and so, yeah, 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 praying over people, that, that's yeah. one of those. So, so Alina, I, I have uh, three kids, um, Lucia, Cecilia, and Augustine. Uh, and I love them. They're, they're wonderful. Um, and other than that, uh, my wife and I still produce music and stuff, but uh, most of our focus and energy is put into Awakened Catholic and, you know, raising our children. We're homeschooling now. Uh, we've got a little taste of that at the beginning of COVID when everyone got a taste of that forcibly. Uh, and uh, we ended up enjoying it and we're still doing it. Um, so, you know, you, you and Teresa have been super helpful in that as well, actually. And we enjoy your friendship and yeah, your yeah. ministry. Yeah, our kids love, love listening to your your vision CD in the car. Oh. That's one of our, that album, check it out. You're not supposed to talk about that album. It's not on the market. Anyway, <laughs> anyway um, you know, uh, a few minutes left, but speak to a couple of different people. I mean, first of all, maybe people who they... they they maybe grew up Catholic, mm. but through a variety of things, maybe inconsistent witnesses of the faith, maybe you know family, broken families. You know, speak to them about yeah. um, why they should return. Absolutely. Consider. Yeah. Being Catholic is just downright the best way to live. Uh, I will say I had a really interesting interaction with someone recently mm. um, who messaged us at Awaken from Ireland. Mm. And she was just lashing out. Like she had had some terrible experiences in her childhood and relatives of hers had had ter- terrible experiences. And it would have been so easy to get defensive or whatever, but it just became this opportunity to just let her share her, her frustrations and then love on her. And I think that um, my, my biggest invitation uh, to anyone that is unsure about Catholicism is um, look for love in you know like the you'll know them by their fruits like i one of the things i found so important in my transition away from protestantism back to catholicism is like i don't want my identity to be wrapped up in the idea of protesting something i want my identity to be wrapped up in submission to the lord and that means i don't have to be okay with something for it to be true that i don't like gravity i would love to walk out of this studio today and just take off like superman but you know what? The truth of the universe doesn't care what I think. And I think that we need to be so willing to, to subjugate ourselves to God's lordship that we do it his way, no matter what that means, because he created you. He created me. He created John Mark. Only he knows what is best for us. And with my children, I tell them things all the times that they don't love. Sometimes they get upset. Sometimes they cry. Sometimes they scream, and I worry that we'll get the cops called on us. And it's like over a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> and and ultimately, they think they know what they want. They think they know what will make them happy. Alina and I know better. And now, amplify that to scale with yeah. God, who is infinite and who is perfect and who literally created us. We, we co-created our kids, but we're not the ones that lined up all those molecules and DNA and all that stuff. God did that. Mm. Um our, our ability to know what's best for them, far superior to their own, but limited. And God knows what is best for me and for all of us. And like, the Catholic Church was instituted by Jesus Christ. If you got a problem with the Catholic Church, then your real issue is with the way Jesus ended up deciding to do things. Hmm. 
He didn't leave us a divine printing press. He left us a church. It's an imperfect church because it was, it's you know, made up of people, and people are imperfect. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's healing. It's powerful. God is active and alive in it. Ask the Holy Spirit to uh, to guide you in your discernment because He will. Yeah. Good stuff, Nick. Thanks so much for sharing your story, brother. I'm glad to uh, hear the the whole story. I've known bits and pieces of it, but yeah. uh, you know, and we. We thank you, audience, for, for listening in, watching in, uh, hearing another story of what our Lord has done. What, what a good God we have. What a great gift we have in the church and in the sacraments, in our lives, in our bodies. You know, let's, uh, let's be thankful for those today. Thanks again for joining us uh, on this episode of the Journey Home program. Uh, we'll see you again next week. God bless.